Greetings to all of you. This is Archbishop Paul André Zorashi of Gatineau. I'm also the Apostolic Administrator of Mont Laurier. In a special way, I greet those who belong to these two beautiful dioceses. And with you on this 21st day of Tuesday, Tuesday of the second week of Easter, to continue exploring the readings that the liturgy proposes to us and see how they can inspire us in these days that are hard to live. Um, so we continue with the Acts, and if you remember, we pick up now where we left off from uh, yesterday, where uh, we saw the prayer and the spirit that acted, and the, the apostles are in this uh, full strength of the, the, the assurance of the spirit so that they can preach. Uh, so now we're, we're at verse 32 to 37 of, verse, of chapter 4, and it continues, uh, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. This, the Spirit is a source of unity. We saw that in uh, Sunday's reading at the end of uh, chapter 2. But Luke comes back to this. The whole group, they were of one heart and one soul. Now, one heart is a typical Jewish expression. We find this very often in the Old Testament that they were the people were of one heart. One soul is a very Greek expression and it was used by the philosophers to describe deep friendship. That friends were of, you know, they, they were the soul friends, my soul friend we speak about. You know, it, it's, it's as if we share the very heart of who we are, our souls. And so th this unity of soul for in the Greek philosophical tradition, it, it led to even sharing of goods. What, what true friends, uh, when you have two friends, they share what they have together. They share everything that they have together. And so this was what happened with this uh, first community in Jerusalem. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions. Everything they ho owned was held in common. So so they own things, but they hold it in common. It's, it's used for each other. We'll see it again. And now we come back again to the apostles themselves. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So it's the favor now. We saw in the a few days ago, they, they had the favor of all the people, but here this grace, this favor, it it's not from the people, so it must be from God. So it's God's graces upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. That was one of the promises that Moses had uh, articulated to the people, you know, when they were in the desert going towards the promised land. He had said, you know, when we will be there, there will not be a needy person among us if we listen to the word of God. Uh, so here, it's like this is this blessing is be realized. There is not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds uh, for what they had sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Laying it at the apostles' feet is a way of recognizing the apostles' leadership. The, their authority, they're bringing it to the apostles so that the apostles can organize the community. So here there's something really interesting that is happening in these texts is that we're going back and forth between the apostles preaching and preaching with assurance and the life of the community that is gathered in one. It's as if the two, you know, they feed off of each other. The love of the members of the community that they have for each other you know, gives assurance to the apostles in their preaching, and the preaching that they give kind of strengthens this sense of unity in the in the community. So the, the lived the lived experience within the community sends the community out into mission. And so there's a beautiful kind of um, two two faces to the life of the early church: the, the church as it gathers and the church as it is sent. This should be the church today too. Our, our life as communities should be intense, powerful, full of love and of the power of prayer. But then it should send us into the world to be witnesses of God's love. We, we don't do this for ourselves. We do it for the mission that Jesus entrusted to the apostles and that the apostles have handed down to us. 
Now, there was a, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph is his name, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Let's stop here for a moment. This, this Joseph, who's, who's, who gets a new name, Barnabas, when you get a name from a figure of authority, it's because you're being given a, a mission. And what is his mission? To be a son of encouragement, Barnabas. To be a son of encouragement, of consolation. And indeed, he will be. Because this will not be the last time we see Barnabas in the Acts of the Apostles. This, he's come onto the stage. He won't leave the stage now. And he's going to play an important role, uh, particularly with Paul, to to build bridges between Paul and the other leadership in, in the church. He will really be a man of consolation and of encouragement. He was a Levite, so he belonged to the tribe of Levi. He was a native of Cyprus, an island in the Mediterranean. And we will see in the story with Paul that this will, uh, this will be part of Paul's first mission. He will be with Barnabas and they will go to Cyprus. So he sold a field that belonged to him, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. And this is the ending of today's reading. What does this have to say to us? Um, you know, it, it tells me that we need to strive for that unity of communion, even if we're isolated, even if we're isolated. Trying to build, well, what I'm doing here you know, in these uh, videos is my effort to try to keep in touch with people and allow people to stay in touch with me uh, through a, a sharing of God's word. I, I see prayer groups forming. They're using, you know, the internet to come together, to pray together, to learn together, to get in touch with each other. We need to continue as a church to build community. This isn't the normal way we do it, but we're discovering it's a very beautiful way. And I, I think when we, when we are able to come back together into our churches, I think we're going to have to keep on using these other ways that allow us to be in contact and to build community with each other. But to remember that this community also is for the mission and the church's mission can't stop. We need to continue to be witnesses of Christ's life and of his love to the people around us. But it invites me also, this, this sharing of the goods, to see that what I have, it, it's not just for me, it's for others. If I, have, uh, if I have just a bit, well, maybe I can survive on this and that's all I can do. And, and, and may God bless me if that's all I can do. And, and that's okay, it's not wrong. But if I have more than what I need, and there are people who are needy around me. How can I hold on to it? Uh, and it's the people around me. And it's not just money. It's attention. It's caring. It's volunteering. It's reaching out. One of the problems with a situation like this is it kind of pushes us to close in on ourselves. And we need to fight this out of love for our brothers and sisters in the faith, and for our brothers and sisters in humanity, we need to reach out to them with everything we are, with love and with the, the, what we can share, whatever it is that we can share to help them along. And if I may, I, you know, I really worry about Africa and South America, where this pandemic is just starting to hit, and they do not have either the resources or the health care services or the hospitals that we have or, or the, the, the necessary uh, government structures to coordinate, I'm afraid it's going to be a catastrophe. And these people need us. They, they will need us and they're already starting to need us. Let, let us reach out to them. And if we can, there are organizations who are already on the ground giving them a hand. Let's think of those organizations and how we can sustain them and support them as they reach out to the poorest of the poor. Let's move on to the gospel. So uh, we're continuing from yesterday's gospel. We're, uh, today we pick up a few of the verses of the last verses of yesterday's gospel. Jesus said to Nicodemus, don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. 
The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, so Nicodemus is saying, if you want to be born of the Spirit, if you want to find your, your, your roots and your identity in the Spirit, if you want to be begotten of the Spirit, you're going to have to let go of your knowledge. You're going to have to let go of your securities. You know, you know, you know. That's how he started the conversation. We know, Jesus, we know. Let go of that. Because what you're dealing with here cannot be compressed into little boxes that your mind is going to be able to hold on to. No less a theologian and a saint than St. Thomas Aquinas once said, that whatever we can say about God, well, it's only a bit of the truth because what we cannot say about God is much greater. We are always dealing with mystery. And this is the sense of this wind that blows where it chooses and we do not know where it comes from and we do not know where it goes. All we can do is we can let it blow through us. And so it's a voice, you know, it says the sound of it, the sound of it, you hear the sound of it, the voice of it. All we can do is listen to this voice and answer. We do not control it. We do not understand it. But we, we hear it and we respond knowing that it calls out the most beautiful and the best that is in us. This is what it means to be born of the Spirit to live of the life of the Trinity, to live in the love of God. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? <laughs> it's finally, Nicodemus is kind of admitting his ignorance. And this is the last word that Nicodemus will have in this dialogue. The rest of the dialogue, as we read tomorrow and, and Thursday, it's Jesus that continues teaching. And this teaching is not just for Nicodemus, it's for all of us who ask the question, how can this be? Teach me, Jesus. Do I come to Jesus wanting to be taught by him? Or do I come with my categories all organized and my ideas all fixed? Even my religious ideas, even if I grew up and I know the catechism inside out, I still do not control the mystery of God. And can I allow myself to be taught by Jesus. How can these things be? This is the question, you know, in Luke's gospel, it's the same question Jesus, uh, Mary asked Gabriel when he said, you know, you're going to have a child and he will be the son of the Most High. How can this be? And, and what was the, uh, Gabriel's answer? The Holy Spirit will, will come upon you. This is how it can be. And here it's the same thing. It's the Spirit that comes to us and it's the Spirit who does it within us. And so G Jesus continues his teaching now. Oh, yes, first of all, yeah, he's, he, he starts by a touch of irony here. I, I, think, I think he's kind of smiling at Nicodemus as he's saying this, you know, plunging in a little life and twisting it. You know, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? You know, you're a specialist and you don't understand? <laughs> Maybe he's, he's inviting Nicodemus to say, well, yeah, please teach me, please teach me. He says, truly I tell you, we speak of what we know. He's, it's as if, you know, uh, Nicodemus started speaking on behalf of the whole Sanhedrin. You could say, well, Jesus is speaking uh, on behalf of his church to be. We know and testify to what we have seen yet you do not receive our testimony. I have told you about earthly things, Nicodemus, and you do not believe. You know, the signs that he's done has not led Nicodemus and the others to believe that he is sent by God. How can I tell you about heavenly things, about resurrection and the gift of the Spirit and, and the world of the life to come? How can I tell you about heavenly things if you can't see what I'm doing here on earth for you. No one has ascended into heaven. You can't make your way up to heaven to see it, Nicodemus. You, you can't make your way up. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descends from heaven, 
you know, I will ascend to heaven. He, he will ascend to heaven in the resurrection. And now he speaks about this ascension. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, we read uh, this, the scripture that tells the story of Moses forging himself a bronze serpent in the desert so that people who had been bitten by venomous snakes could, you know, turn uh, and, and pray and be healed through the power of God. And three times in John's Gospel, Jesus will refer to the story of the, the serpent lifted up on a pole and he will say, I will be lifted up on a pole. And he's speaking of the cross. I will be lifted up, exalted, he's saying, because the moment where I die on the cross will be the moment where I return to the Father and am received by the Father and am exalted and glorified in the Father. And then whoever believes in the Son of Man will have eternal life. This, this text, I think, speaks to us about uh, oh, being open to the Spirit and to the teaching of Jesus, allowing us ourselves to be taught by Jesus and to be, you know, led by the Spirit. In these days where we have more time to ourselves, let, let's, let's use this time to, to really deepen our prayer, to listen to Jesus, to try to seek what he's saying and to open our hearts to the Spirit the spirit of, of love and of life and of hope. This is my prayer for you. And with this prayer, I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.